Now, I suppose that Eden is probably not what uh, Zabel Pinozian is nostalgic for on that record. Uh, I don't know what she's nostalgic for, if it's, you know, uh, Ararat or the grave, really. And I don't know why I got so fixated on a couple of these voices. But I mentioned at the beginning of all of this that there was one box of records that were in Greek that started me off. And in particular, there was one voice that has driven me crazy for years. My poor wife has to put up with this presence in the house of this woman who's been dead for more than a half a century all the time, like she's a member of the family. Her name is Marika Papagika. And um, I got really obsessed with uh, trying to learn Marika's story. Uh, and trying to bring it to life, um, and uh, I, I, with some mixed success. But anyway, I'll try and give you the nutshell version. Um, Marika was born December 1890 on a little island called Kos, about seven kilometers off the coast of Anatolia. Um, Kos had been Greek for a very long time. Homer tells us that they sent uh, troops to fight on the side of the Greeks uh, in the Trojan Wars. Uh, Hippocrates was from there. Um, been Greek for a long time. And uh, we don't know why Marika left, but it could be that in uh, 1912, um, as the Ottoman Empire was falling apart and uh, Britain and France were making grabs for influence and territory uh, in the former Ottoman areas, over petroleum, by the way, in large part, you know, over uh, influence and control of, of oil, um, Italy, kind of went, yeah, us too, we want some too. And so Italy made the last grabs of what, you know, basically you know, Britain and France hadn't grabbed yet, which was uh, Libya, and they're back, by the way, and uh, the Dodecanese, uh, including Kos. So a lot of people fled when the Italians came in and began to occupy the island. I don't know if that's why Marika left. I think that she was probably touring uh, like a circuit of cafes that you could do. You could go from Athens to Constantinople to Smyrna, uh, maybe to inland to Aleppo, but certainly to Beirut, uh, Cairo, and Alexandria, and stay a few months, pick up repertoire, uh, meet other musicians. Um, where we definitely find her is the end of 1914, the beginning of 1915 in Alexandria. Uh, she recorded 11 sides, uh, for what was then known as the Gramophone Company. Only one of those uh, recordings is known to exist, a single copy of one of those records, which I have not heard, um, but I'm told is a rather unremarkable patriotic ditty about the then contemporary Balkan Wars. And we don't know why, uh, less than a year later, she and her husband uh, got on a boat uh, from Piraeus and uh, sailed to the US. Her husband was her accompanist, and. Uh, probably a ranger. His name was Costantinos, Costas. In America, we called him Gus. Um, and again, we don't exactly know what they did for three years, from 1915 to 1918. I think they may have toured. I think they probably got a band together and started touring around um, another circuit. Boston, New York, Chicago, Detroit, uh, Baltimore, D.C.? Don't know. But um, certainly... Uh, they arrive again at Victor Records at the end of 1918 and begin recording. When they go six months later to the rival company and uh, record 24 sides in a space of about a month, um, Marika becomes a star. Those records sell like hotcakes, and they're really good records. Um, people uh, lapped it up. Like I said, nine Greek men for every one Greek woman. So here's this woman who remembers from home. And unlike the other Greek female singers at the time, Marika could sing. She had a, a rival who lived just around the corner who had her own independent company. Uh, Madame Kula was the name she used. Her, her label was called Panhellenion. And uh, yeah, the big difference is Kula couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. Marika could sing. And she stayed with the major labels and recorded 250 performances inside of a decade. Vast repertoire and a uh, wide range of stuff, but also, unlike her contemporaries, unlike other women performing in that time, in that place, um, 
you had the option to get up in front of the guys and shake it, you know, do like a belly dance piece, do some Chef Ticelli stuff, um, show off a little bit, play some tambourine, and have some guys throw you some money. Marika never recorded a single piece like that. Um, there was no good time girl shenanigans out of Marika. She reserved her voice for expressions of dignity, of uh, grace, of yearning, love, patriotism, and on a few instances of yearning to become American. She recorded a couple of songs about uh, um, bobbing your hair and uh, using electricity and other stuff that Americans do. But um, by the mid-20s, she uh, and her husband owned their own nightclub, which was the first of uh, a group of clubs that sprouted up around New York that were basically reproductions of the old cafes from the Eastern Mediterranean. It was called Marika's, and um, she performed there all the time. You could always go see her af after you get off work. This woman who remembers home, who remembers the songs, sings them beautiful. Um, and then, kind of out of the blue, 1929, the stock market crash ends her career. Just She may have already been in financial trouble, I don't know, but just whammo. They lose the club, and uh, she leaves Manhattan and moves to Staten Island, a little tiny island, thousands and thousands and thousands of miles from the little tiny island she came from. She made a comeback attempt in 1937, which flopped. Things had changed, the style had changed, she was old-fashioned by that point. And uh, then, in 1943, at the age of 53 years old, for reasons we still don't understand, she dies at home. Uh, her husband died four years later, the same year that Kos, after having been under foreign rule for some four or five hundred years, was repatriated to Greece. So this is Marika kind of her, at her peak. This is one of the first records actually made with a microphone in New York in 1926. It's the uh, Galata Manas. Galata is a, a neighborhood of Istanbul, a very cosmopolitan area. And um, the lyrics are uh, simple stuff. The more I pull away from the flame, the more it burns me, and I curse my fate, for it always hurts me.
So Marika remembered the song from home and this disc, this black disc made of ground stone and the secretion of an insect from South Asia, the lac beetle, mixed together, the bug goo and the stone, remembers Marika's voice. Goethe was supposed to have said, whatever we encounter that is great or beautiful or significant need not be remembered from outside, need not be hunted up and laid hold of, as it were. Rather, from the beginning, it must be woven into the fabric of our inmost self, must become one with it, create a new and better self in us, and thus live and become a productive force in ourselves. There's no past that one is allowed to long for. There's only the eternally new, growing from the enlarged elements of the past. And genuine longing must always be productive, must always create something new and better. This is a great privilege. Thank you all so much.